Welcome to the Supply Chain Talks podcast. My name is Sophie van den Enk, and in this season, the second season, I will dive into the world of sustainable container supply chains. As decision makers, cargo owners, and freight forwarders play a key role in boosting sustainability in the logistics chain. But how do you build a CO2 neutral and at the same time resilient supply chain? And what are the possibilities and standout examples that exist today? Reduce, replace, rethink is a concept that can be used as a strategy to decarbonize your supply chain. Each episode, I will dive into one of these three concepts with container industry experts. In this episode, we're talking with cargo owner Rico about Rethink. So Rico is a leading document management solutions provider, and I want to know more about that in just a second, and is committed to sustainability. We'll discuss their innovative approach to reporting and rethinking their supply chain. Joining me today are Martijn Spee and Martin Swin- Swinnerton from Rico's facility in the Netherlands, Bergopzoon, that covers five, uh, 50 Thousand eight, eight soccer fields, eight <laughs> soccer fields of square meters, and handles uh, twelve thousand orders daily. You already heard Martijn a little bit, <laughs> so that's that's a huge space. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about what it is that Rico does? Yeah, my name is Martijn Spee, as you mentioned. Uh, um, I work for Rico for fifteen years. I'm a transport manager, so I'm responsible for the, the distribution in Europe. And in Bergen Zone, we have our uh, European distribution center. Um, and from that facility, we are delivering all across Europe. Uh, and what we do is, is, yeah, we are a manufacturer from region, but we're turning more into an, a service provider, IT service provider. You're a leading document management solutions provider. Now, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Yeah, I, f- I think our, our original product is, is the copier machine. Uh, but now we everybody's using a copier machine uh, in a different way. So mm-hmm. it's really, we are selling document solutions by digitalizing your document uh, feeds, your, your, let's say, invoicing process. And the machines are still helping in that process by, for right. example, scanning papers into a digital environment. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, so copier machine, we can understand and we yeah. can also understand that the world is evolving and that the copier machine takes a different shape and form yeah. these days. Martin, it's it's a bit confusing. We have Martijn and yeah. Martin. Yeah. Uh, um, um, it's good to have you here too. What You also have been with Rico for 15 years. Correct, yeah. So um, I, I'm Martin Swinnerton. I work uh, as a business excellence manager for Rico Supply Chain. Um, originally from the UK, um, and I came over here. Um, and what I do over there is um, I look after the compliance and a sort of risk management area of Rico. Um, but also uh, we have quite a lot of projects running, so manage the project office for supply chain. And one of my, um, let's say, um, favorite uh, topics is actually sustainability. So mm. I, I run the program for supply chain, um, and that's where I'm a sort of partner in crime with Martijn, uh, where we've been working for many years already on uh, re- reducing carbon emissions and sort of, like you say, rethinking the way we do logistics. Yeah. So, and um, why do you, why is that one of your favorite topics? What, what's so fun? Well, because it's, I guess it's an important topic. So, um, you know, uh, especially in the world we live in, um, it's like it's a good way to contribute as a company to uh, sort of making the world a better place. Um and um, <clears throat> we've been quite successful. So Rico, um, from its origin, um, as our founder, the founding principles, um, he came up with a our, our founder Kiyoshi Ishimura um, in 1936 already defined um, the principle of uh, love your uh, neighbor, love your country, love your work, um, and that very much lines up with the modern philosophy of CSR, which is uh, people, planet, and profit. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it's an important topic for Rico, and it's something that we're given a lot of space to work on in supply chain. Um, it's a strategic theme as well for for Rico. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, it's very it's very interesting how those things all sort of go hand in hand. That's exactly what we're trying to sort of discuss and discover mm-hmm. in this podcast. Like, how does that work? Because you guys can really help other companies get inspiration from from your experience especially since you've been at this for so long and it's very much at the core the, the the dna of um of rico what what 
what drives this commitment? Is it really that 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 DNA, or is it the changes in the world that you see today? Is it the the opportunities, the business opportunities that lie within them? Who, which Mar Martin Martin <laughs> wants to take this one? Well, Martin, I, I think we have the strategy yeah. already for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, I've, to be honest. Uh, I believe uh, that that we were a little bit were ahead. So so it's in our strategy already since at least 2015. I mm -hmm. think our CEO spoke in Paris in, in 2015 on, on the climate uh, conference. Mm -hmm. um, but we see now that it's it's getting more important from different angles. So mm -hmm. there uh, the customers are requiring it more. We want to yeah actually the supply chain is 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 90 of our total footprint. So so it's really important to to take the role. Mm -hmm. And next to that, there will become more, more and more governmental rules about yeah. it. So, uh, yeah. yeah, because if you take, if you look at it from from this risk perspective, it's also kind of a risk not yeah. to take yeah, this perspective exactly, into yeah. account. I mean, when I joined Rico, um, I was really surprised to see it was a company, a corporate organization. It had an environmental division, like so they had, let's say, all over the world, uh, people working on sustainable product design. And processes, um, sustainable logistics. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, again, it's come from our DNA. Mm -hmm. um, what Rico also does a lot of is um, we, we focus on circularity. So obviously we want to sell new machines to customers. But what happens when the machine is end of life? Um, we need to think about how to reuse that. Um, so we have a lot of processes designed um, already for many, many years, thinking about how to reuse parts, how to refill, for example, toner cartridges, mm -hmm. and even remanufacture uh, machines to use them at other customers. Um, wow. We call okay. that the Comet Circle uh, cons yeah. concept. Yeah. And and to to do that in a way that is still very uh, viable uh, for for business, yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. is 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 very it's an interesting. Um, Martin, your focus lies in the um, transportation yes, division. Obviously, we're <laughs> in the port of Rotterdam, so we need to talk transport too. Could you walk us through the the journey of one of your products um, from manufacturing yeah. to final delivery? Yeah, we 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 are global. We're shipping on a global level. So our 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 manufacturing is is based in Asia. So in Japan, China, and Thailand, uh, there are our main factories. Uh, we ship them for the European region. We ship them all to 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 Rotterdam. We're talking about like five five thousand containers uh, mm. a year. Um, they're going by by big vessels. We ship them to Rotterdam, and we collect ninety five percent of the port of Rotterdam with barges to Bergen op Zoom. Mm -hmm. Barge is a inland vessel. Yeah. Um, and from there uh, we store it in the in the in the Bergen Zone facility, and from there we ship it all across Europe. So by parcel, a, a truck, by container, by rail. A lot of uh, if you go to Italy, for example, and Spain, and from there we deliver it to dealers or to can to customers. Um, so we have a big network of a lot of modalities, a lot of shipments. Yeah. Um, and in the end, we also need to collect the machines again at the customers. I was just going to say, because we talk about the circularity, mm -hmm. you're, you're now talking about new product Correct. coming in. Yeah. But you mm -hmm. also receive uh, products that have been used and that you want to... Uh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah we take back... Uh, so all of our machines, once the end of contract, we bring them back. And then we think about how to reuse um, some machines we can't reuse because they may be just too old. Uh, so we will... Uh, let's say recycle them mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we have some machines that we have um, a wonderful site in Colmar in the Alsace in mm -hmm. France uh, which is a nice place anyway yeah, yeah. anyway <laughs> uh, but they they um, they have a remanufacturing process where we take thousands of devices and, and remanufacture them into a product called Greenline what um, is that? it's a fully remanufactured Rico printer um, which is as new, mm -hmm. um, uh, but we try to reuse as many of the original parts as we can. So some of the key components are replaced. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, we wipe the uh, data, so disks are cleaned and so on. Um, but we can resell that as a new machine. Wow, yeah. Um, so a different sort of um, marketing concept. Um, and th this is... It, is part of our portfolio. So mm. if we have requests from, say, governmental organization or different company for sustainable um, device, then we can offer this as a product uh, 
which is more sustainable right. from, from its nature. Yeah. yeah, and if you look at that from a transportation point of view, then that's different because you can't really operate in in bulk as much as you can with your regular virgin. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Printer. So what we do, we also have local warehouses in in Europe, and that enable us to ship in bulk to these warehouses. So that, but that's one way. So and, and therefore we use a lot of sustainable solutions like like real transportation. Uh, but in the end, we also need to think of how to to get the machines back. And we, for example, if we if we collect machines from the from the countries back to to the Colmore factory, mm. we're using double deck trailers, so so it can be two or three stacked in in one trailer. So yeah. instead of using one or two trucks, you do only one. Um, so we're thinking of, of how to do that, and that that's that's we do that more in the last years. We even have also a program manager for this, uh, who was one of our colleagues, really focusing on that, and that really helps. Yeah, because how do you make transportation more sustainable? What specific actions are involved? Is that the mode of transportation mostly you think about? Or? Yeah, but it can also be more efficient. So so increase your loading efficiency. That's very mm. important. Mm. Uh, make sure that 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 um, you cooperate with your partners. Uh, that you reduce the empty <coughs> kilometers, not only for yourself but only for also for them. Um, but yeah, modality is very important for us. So um, don't ship, uh, reduce your number of air shipments to, for example, to ocean. Reduce the number of road transportation to rail shipments. Um, reduce your service level, for example, for parcels from express to to standard service, mm -hmm. which means that it don't fly but it goes by road. All those kind of things um, yeah. are very important to do. And how difficult is it to rethink a process when a company has been around for a while? Then you yeah. carry your certain DNA, which can be a good thing, but you're also trying to reshape things that have sort of turned into a certain way. And this Correct. is how we do Correct. it. Correct. Yeah, you, you rethink, uh, you need to rethink your routings, your, your gravity, where, where your locations are. Uh, you need to rethink your, your service level. So you need to engage with your, with your customers so saying, okay, the, the world is changing. So we need to rethink, we, we cannot ship everything on, on the highest service level, on the fastest way. We need to, to change that because the world is changing. We need to, we need to take responsibility yeah. with all of us. But you mentioned that customers are also interested in this. Uh, so th are they willing to, to engage with yeah, you and to I proactively think, think about it? We're this? starting to, to have that conversation now. So it's, um, you know, do you need to have it tomorrow? Or can we plan better and maybe deliver it in three days? So we don't need to air freight, for example, a toner right. through a uh, parcel network. We can use maybe the, the, the regular truck delivery. And uh, as those trucks become more and more maybe electrified, then it becomes almost the possibility to deliver carbon neutral. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, customers are definitely interested. Also, the way it arrives at customers. So uh, we always get questions and remarks about packaging. Mm -hmm. And I think um, we've all experienced re receiving, you know, when we order pa uh, parcels online, where you trying to find the thing you've ordered uh, <laughs> yeah. and it's got airbags and whatnot. Uh, yes, hidden so, in a so, really big box. So that's yeah. something we've re worked really hard on to eliminate uh, those type of things from yeah. our delivery processes. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And that's also initially we had, let's say, customers commenting, can you do this better and in a different way? Yeah. yeah. Something that always really strikes me when you talk about sustainability and all the gains that you can make is how much collaboration is uh, involved or mm. how, how much value that mm. actually brings to really think together about how can, how can we make this better? How can we, because there might be blind spots for you as a provider that uh, your customer can actually communicate to you and you're like, oh, this is great. We can actually save and be more efficient. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's in, what I said, it's important to, to connect with your partners. So you need to make a strategy, you, make, you need to make a roadmap, do it together with your partners mm -hmm. and have the same strategy. Yeah. So how, how, how do you organize that within RICO, Martin? Like I mentioned earlier, it was a, it is a strategic topic, so that really helps. So if the board is asking, then you're likely to get things done uh, yeah. in the we area. We need to get the board to ask it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, and we have like... Sustainability is a, a, a global strategy of RICO. It's a European business strategy and it's a supply chain strategy. So there's a big cascade of, the, you know. Um, so we develop plans. Uh, we've been developing plans already for, you know, more than 10 years in this area. Um, we have different, uh, let's say, focus areas, for example, carbon reduction and logistics. We also have an area around um, reuse of products. Right. Yeah. Mm. And, and and in order to take those steps forward, I imagine it's 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 
crucial to have insight into where we touched on this a little bit already. Mm. Like where can you optimize? Um, how do you uh, measure your carbon emissions? Why why is that measurement so so vital? You really need to get insight first before you can actually improve. Um, so where so you you need to know in what areas uh, uh, your footprint is higher compared to to the other ones. So we do that on yearly base. Uh, we, sh- we we started it in 2020, but we also use the software to to recalculate the data as from 2015 um, because we still had the data, mm-hmm. and we saw that we reduced uh, 23% since 2015 compared to 2020. So, and that and that's really great because in these years we did a lot of things. Uh, I think we we put 20% of our cargo on rail transportation compared to uh, to 2015. So it's really good to see the, the, the result of your effort. Um, and we also be rewarded by the Lean and Green Star, the first one. So that's also in line with our strategy mm-hmm. to, to really keep producing. To get awards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we are really now targeting on 4% reduction per year. Yeah. yeah. And not only to, because the, for example, the trucks are getting better. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the emission per truck is, is getting lower, but also what we are really want to, to do this 4% with our own decisions. So uh, making the model shift, being more efficient. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, those kind of things. Yeah, and I imagine the first years of improving 4% are, are sort of re- relatively easier because course, yeah. you, then you can handle the low hanging low fruit. fruit but, yeah. <laughs> but now you're that's like, true. Yeah, that's true. what's the opposite of low hanging fruit? You, you like can't that. move everything to rail. So uh, right. that's what we started with into like modal shift mm-hmm. to railways. But then how do you, um, you know, then there's a little bit of a uh, like maybe a, a point on the horizon where. Technology needs to be yep. maybe more the answer. So yes. m- more green uh, transport modes, electrification, hydrogen power, those kind of things. We're, and that's where we really need to collaborate with our carriers. Um, you know, they, they need to come with solutions and, and ideas where we can have a go. How um, how about ocean freight? Because yep. you mentioned, of course, that you can't move everything to rail. If you have uh, production in Asia, you're going to want to also have ocean uh, freight. So what initiatives are is Rico undertaking to embrace? Yeah, you, you still be? really rely on the ocean freight. That, yeah. That's that's the only possi- possibility. Um, so what, what we do, we also invest in, uh, in uh, biofuel. So uh, sm- a portion of our containers are being, uh, yeah, it's offsetting of insetting these uh, 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 this cargo. So so we are we saw with also with certificates that we indeed have a lower footprint with the same vessels. Mm-hmm. Um, we really have strategies to 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 keep the air freight as minimal as possible. Only do it by exception if we really have problems. Uh, and you see that also declining year by year. And on the other side, it's also very important that that and that's the role of the Port of Rotterdam that that. You will really have an efficient um, handling of the containers. Mm-hmm. So, for example, um, when you have 70% of, of your containers by barge to your inland terminal, you can you can really increase that by having an efficient port. And, mm-hmm. and that's also where we are successful and we are keep increasing the number. So we're really aiming to have yeah, at least 95% of the containers by barge into uh, into the inland terminal. Yeah, because if you're looking to improve each year those that that, that 4%, um, obviously you're looking at at your 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 transportation uh, over the ocean. But once you arrive in the port, mm-hmm. that's where you can also yep. save. What what roles? What more possibilities are there? Do you no, think? I think it's important that you also need to rely on the, on the. Um, uh, on the innovation and the, te- and the t- t- yeah the tactic behind it, you see that mm-hmm. the vessels are already new b- new vessels are being built with with uh, with more sustainable uh, uh, vessels. I think one is also doing that now, uh, but also Port of Rotterdam keeps need to invest in in infrastructure. So uh, I hope that in the next coming years we can, for example, use electric trucks to collect the containers. So if we need to collect it by truck. Um, we can use those kind of vehicles, but mm-hmm. on the other hand, they need to be charged somewhere. So that's also important that that Port of Rotterdam is facilitating those kind of uh, innovations. And are are they? They are. Yeah. <laughs> I know that. So <laughs> I I, uh, I know that they are investing in electric uh, uh, charging stations, but also the infrastructure for the rail connections from uh, from Maasvlakte is very important to to get containers into the mainland to even to Germany by uh, by, by by rail. So. Mm. Yeah, that is important, and also be in uh, be um, that you're in hosp- hospitality. Um, I say it uh, 
gastvrij. Ja, yeah, hospitality. Hospitality, yeah. Yeah. hospitality for, for the barges. So, <laughs> so that, that, that barges want to come to your port to, to collect the containers. So, yes. Uh, yeah. You receive all your uh, shipments from Asia into Europe via Rotterdam. Yeah. Yeah. Why is that choice? Why is it Rotterdam for you? <clears throat> Um, it's the number one port. So yeah. basically, it's Europe's <laughs> biggest port. Uh, <clears throat> we, um, yeah, we decided to put the logistics center of in Bergen op Zoom due to that fact that uh, you know Rotterdam is the gateway to Europe. Um, it's always nice to hear a non-Dutch pe- person say this. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, so, so from that perspective, uh, it really makes sense. But also, you know, the connections between Rotterdam and Asia are, you know. Um, the, also the best they're, in Europe. They're the first so, uh, port, so the, the vessels come yeah. directly from Asia into Rotterdam. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We have factories in Thailand, uh, China, uh, Japan, mm. so we need those connections um, directly, and yeah, that's what Rotterdam offers. Mm. Um, and it's only you know then an hour and a half max to Bergen op Zoom to the central point where we can distribute across Europe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. to be honest, we 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 are as close as Antwerp as Rotterdam. Yeah. So, so why are we choosing Rotterdam? So that's, it's also mainly because of all the, the IT infrastructure behind it, like port base, uh, the connection with the customs is very easy. Um, and in, there are there there is more capacity to collect from Rotterdam by barges. So, uh, and indeed what we mentioned, it is the first uh, port mm-hmm. for the vessel, but also for the outbound logistics, yeah. it's also the last port. So for example, if you ship to, to Africa, it, you always have the shortest lead time for Rotterdam because this is the last port before it sails to that region. Right. Yeah. So you're really looking for a place that um, that does not um, Im- impose any extra effort. Like you want everything to be smooth. So the good data infrastructure, Correct. good uh, transmission to yeah. barges, that all those things help make this drive this decision yeah. and continues to make you want to choose Rotterdam. Yeah. Our 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 terminal in a terminal partner they have they are doing the, the most work for us we just sail to them okay these are our containers in and outbound and, and they arrange it for us and they can do that because of they have the inter the, the interface with the with the, the system that, mm-hmm. so they have fixed calls so it's really easy to get the containers to rotterdam yeah so there's there's certain time slots just always yeah. available yeah. through yeah. them yeah. yes okay i get it um and how um how, what percentage of emissions do you reduce through this intermodal uh, 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 transportation yeah, twenty percent in the first five years, yeah. basically. So yeah. we did a twenty percent. Um, <clears throat> we that's found huge. There is a lot, yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's yeah, but the difference between basically rail and road. Well, and of, of course that's part of, of your job, uh, Martin, to to predict sort of this this demand and ensuring this on time mm-hmm. delivery uh, to cus- customers. And that's that's a very complex task because every customer is different, and you want mm-hmm. to deliver good service to every individual one. Um, what are the challenges in in this area? What are people willing to put put up with for the environment? Or what, what do you yeah, see as I the mean, challenges w- there? We've designed a business which is like used to delivering next day service. And people got the, really spoiled. Yeah, people get really spoiled. And it's <laughs> like when we order packets at home as well, we get them tomorrow. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. And um, I think with better predictive planning, we, we, for example, on our devices, we can now predict remotely uh, when a toner is going to run out. So Instead of uh, predicting that one day before, maybe we set the, you know, settings to three or four days, then we have more time to deliver a toner bottle. And based on that information, do you also make uh, modality shifts? Like, do you yes? Say- so, so that would mean that our um, parcel carriers would not necessarily need to air freight it. So they have big air freight networks, but they could maybe move it through their road transport network or even with bike couriers. Um, so yeah, that kind of technology visibility mm-hmm. um, is really helping to change the way we do things. Yeah. You know, for example, we're now also rethinking our our network to Poland. Uh, carriers are also improving. So in Warsaw, for example, you'll be there in two days compared yeah. to three, four days uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. So you are able to 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 make that shift. In in for example, sh- delivering to two days is also acceptable at this moment compared to the one day by air. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, that, that last mile solution, of course, really demands something completely mm. different. Because yeah. I'm sort of first imagining these huge bulk ships coming in and then it comes becomes smaller and mm. smaller yeah, and, and more close knit um, yeah. solutions. What are the what are the challenges there? But the challenge is to, to get it to the local networks. Yeah. That's the most challenging yeah. one. So if you are a European shipper like us, um, you cannot have an, an, a warehouse in every country because mm-hmm. that's that's mm-hmm. that you need to have a central supply chain. You have a central warehouse. So make sure that you use local hubs. And, and as said, it's really easy to ship sustainable from that local hub. Yeah. But the challenge is to get it there. Yeah. And so, then to, to figure out where that hub should be, that probably. Yeah, you can do gravity studies. So so uh, you, you need to know where your customers are. You need to know the volumes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can you need you have need to have tools for that to to see that from where do we need to uh, yeah to put local hubs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or for example, a partner has already a hub somewhere because his customers are always there and you can connect to those kind of uh, hubs. Yeah. Um well, Rico, of course, has a lot of experience uh, already rethinking, or maybe maybe in your case, it's not necessarily even rethinking because you started out thinking this way. Mm-hmm. Um, so with all that experience, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on some advice you might be able to give to cargo owners that are really facing these same challenges, mm-hmm. but also the same desire to yeah. to want to make things more I think it is a little bit about change management and you know the desire comes from first of all getting it on the agenda so uh, you know the advice to any company would be make it strategic topic make sure the board owns the topic yes then develop plans and then you can cascade that through by measuring the way you know your carbon emissions are or, or you know your performance in the different areas um, and then identify the initiatives that you need to to actually you know make it happen. So the cascade is important. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, f- I think we all learned a lot in the last years. So supply chain was always very stable, and then COVID kicks in. So I I, I think the whole the, the the shippers and that's something everybody needs to be do is to make sure that that you're agile and are able to adapt to changes. We also have the crisis now in the Red Sea. So. We are now able to, let's say, better uh, able to 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 cope with those changes. Mm-hmm. Um, because change. those changes or, or influences will always be there. I mean, if yeah, it's, it's, not, if it's not COVID, it's, so, yeah, it's not exceptional <laughs> It'll be anymore. The... It was, and now it's not anymore. Yeah. So you need to make sure that your processes uh, are able to adapt to those kind of disruptions. Yes. And that's yes. very important. Yeah, because the disruption is sort of the stable factor at this yeah, point. Yeah, it's a stable yeah. factor. And, yeah. and a couple of years ago, we were really panicking in these kind of situations. Yeah. We still sometimes do a little bit, but we are it's more mature now. It's good to be a little bit to, panicky. Yeah, like you need to be panicked because otherwise <laughs> you don't find the right stay solution. Stay awake. But mm-hmm. Yeah, you stay awake. That's a good thing. So, um, yeah, we developed a lot of our supply chain in the last years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, panicked and resilient. Uh, something that I also really took from your story is that to really attach a number to it, so four percent every yeah. year, that that yeah. that really is a driver for for being uh, staying curious about. Okay, how can yeah. we still improve yeah. now? We've yeah. done all this, yeah. but you don't become complacent. About it's like it. we said, we took the low hanging fruit, and now we need to be really creative to find the next four percent and yeah. the next four percent. Exactly, and, and that, that means you know really going to our partners and saying, okay. We need your help. How do we do this? You know, uh, yeah. we can't do it from our distribution center sitting in Bergen up zone. We need to go out to our partners yeah. and make it happen. You really yeah. need to act now, otherwise you are too late. Because if the regulation will come and you're not there ready, then mm. you have a problem. Yeah, you want to be in yeah. front yeah. of that. Well, thank you, uh, Martijn and Martin, <laughs> both of you, <laughs> you. so very thank much you. for these, um, yeah, shedding a light uh, on, on how you are rethinking or maybe thinking about uh, your supply chain uh, practices. It's very inspiring to, to hear your enthusiasm yeah. and excitement about, about the topic. It really comes from um, within. In the next episode of Supply Chain Talks, I will be joined by Portbase. We <laughs> already heard its name in this episode and APM Terminals. For example, last week we uh, discharged uh, the Manila Maersk with uh, 10,151 moves. Then it's really important that those containers get to flow out of the terminal in a seamless uh, seamless way. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so we need to know where do the containers go, where can we position them right in the yard to avoid congestion. Um, and that information is what we get via port base. If you want to know more, check out portofrotterdam.com slash container shipping. Thank you so much for joining me again, gentlemen. Thank <laughs> and thanks Cheers. to all our listeners. I hope you will tune in again to the Supply Chain Talks podcast. Thank you. Thank you.